I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll get going. Okay, looks like we have a, a good group here and can get started. And first, let me just say hi, it's been a little while. I think we had our last meeting in May and uh, it's been a couple of months. I hope that all of you have had a chance to get out and enjoy the summer a little bit. And it really feels good to, to see you and, and be together again. We can't thank you enough for the contributions that you have made and we hope uh, we'll be willing to continue to make. But maybe before I jump in and, and get started, I'm gonna surprise Jim Russell. And Jim, you're a member of our board and one of the co-chairs of one of our working groups. Just wonder if anything you'd like to say by way of introduction before we get started? You no, know, you woke me up. Actually, I was working on something else. Sorry about that. <laughs> I uh, thought you might. And we, yeah, no. No, not really. Just appreciate everybody's uh, input, I, I think just seeing the process unfold, um, it's become very clear that we've had a lot of good relevant input from a lot of different stakeholders that has helped us to be able to develop, I think, a plan going forward that, that's very beneficial for the state and for the citizens of Utah and just appreciate the effort and input that everybody has been given It's uh, and, and your interest in participating. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate those those thoughts, and uh, it is good to get back with everybody. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here and share some thoughts. So we've called these meetings milestone workshops because we've gathered together at key milestones during our planning process, and yet I think that's a term that probably applies more to today's meeting than anything. This is a key milestone as we gather with you and share with you the framework master plan that will shortly be released to the public. And uh, wanted to uh, let you see it first and get the preview before others because of your many contributions to bringing this about. But before I go any farther, I wanna start with an introduction. Uh, Scott Cuthbertson, who's on this call, joined our team last week as our Director of Operations. Scott has a, a terrific background, been in uh, management consulting for over 15 years, working on many large infrastructure and capital development projects around the world uh, for you know, household name companies around the world. And he's back in Utah, uh, wants to contribute to uh, his, the state where he now lives, and uh, so a terrific addition to what we're doing. His role is kind of to be a jack of all trades, and so he's doing a lot of uh, administrative functions, helping us with our, our budgeting and processes, but also helping with strategic thinking, uh, outreach, and he'll just be involved in all of the key decisions that we make going forward. So, uh, Scott, welcome, and uh, Say hi to everybody real quick. Hey, thanks, thanks, Alan. I'm really uh, excited to be with you all, and uh, you can you can feel the uh, the energy. It's a, a great time to to come on board, and you know a lot of uh, thoughtful, diligent work's gone into uh, this plan, and uh, I'm excited to to benefit from that and uh, keep the momentum going. So, thank you. Thanks, Scott, and welcome. So before we get into uh, the details of the framework plan, I just want to kind of bring everybody up to speed on where we are. So a little over a year ago, we created uh, five working groups. You can see the titles here. Stakeholder group was mostly elected officials uh, who could uh, be a sounding board, provide input from their communities, and make sure that we're representing the public good. The other groups are kind of self-explanatory and have experts in these fields who have brought 
really high level thinking to what we've done. These, these working groups, uh, I just think back on the last year and what's been accomplished and many ways it's gone fast, but we've uh, developed the working group report. You outlined the key vision elements that have been really the framework for developing this plan. Uh, we used these key vision elements to select our planning team. We've used it to organize our thinking and the framework plan that you'll see today. The Stakeholder Advisory Committee met a couple of times during the framework planning process. This is a group representing uh, various constituencies in our community, bringing their own expertise and, and viewpoints making sure that we're thinking about the community good. And I've just got to say, this has been such a, a valuable group. You've challenged our thinking, our assumptions, provided ideas that are creative and interesting, and certainly made a difference in the plan going forward. And you'll see some of that today. So we, we took the time and calculated how much time you have collectively put in to this process. And it's over 3,100 hours. Um, you know, if we could have gotten some of you to stay on the whole way, we would have gotten up to 3,127 hours and 38 minutes, maybe 30, maybe to 40, who knows? But uh, you were just really helpful in this. And um, this is a big commitment. And to answer the question on all of your minds, uh, no, we're not going to pay you for it, but uh, we will give you our, our thanks and appreciation and the satisfaction of doing something good for the community. You can also see that uh, the members of the public have been tracking the work we've done through our social media posts, uh, reviewing the recordings of these meetings, and really tracking the input that we've received. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You've seen it before, but uh, this kind of gives us a sense for where we are in our process. From the early idea that came out of the Prison Relocation Commission to move the prison site, selecting the new site, the Point of the Mountain Development Commission that conducted public process and involved many thousands of Utahns in yeah. uh, looking at a vision for the Point of the Mountain region to the formation of the Point of the Mountain Land State Land Authority and the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years. So here we are with our framework plan, just about ready to be released, far from being done with the work that we have to do. And we'll be uh, talking about it a little bit later in uh, today's meeting, but we have a number of steps to prepare for and then begin implementation of the vision for the site, hoping that we can accomplish all of the goals that you've helped outline in that process. So the last uh, several months from the beginning of 2021, we've been involved in this framework plan process led by uh, SOM, Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, who've done uh, just a fantastic job of bringing uh, terrific professionals, great experience to the table, working with our internal team working with all of you and the public to create a framework that I think we can be proud of. You know, we gathered information early in the year, reached out to a number of groups. Uh, we started testing different ideas and drawing up mock plans, uh, evaluated them based on various uh, criteria and using uh, a number of sophisticated metrics. We've started to hone in on a particular plan again with your input and uh, now after some months of refinement we've got the framework plan in place so what comes next i mentioned that we're about to release this plan to the public and that'll happen at an open house conducted on august 12th from four to seven at the fred house training academy which is just across the uh, just across I-15 from the existing prison site. It's the training facility for the Department of Corrections. It'll be available remotely so people can tune in that way, but a chance for folks to get together, hear a quick overview of what we've done, 
and then interact with the subject matter experts that have helped develop the plan and ask questions and provide input. Uh, we expect that there will be some pretty good media coverage that will be associated with that. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, I think at this point, we won't keep you in suspense any longer. <laughs> and uh, we'll turn it to Pete Kendall from SOM to run through the summary of the plan. It'll look pretty familiar because you've seen the, the drafts going forward, but uh, a number of refinements that I think have been responsive to concerns you've raised and things that, that make it better. I will just emphasize one thing, and that is that this is a framework plan, meaning it's not a done deal. And there's plenty more work to be done. And there are refinements to be made We'll be talking more to members of the public, to the development community, uh, refining the plan based on market realities and changes. And while we've tried to do everything we can to study the market, to make sure that it's not just aspirational, but also practical, uh, we, we anticipate that things will evolve over time and always for the better. So with that, Pete, I'll turn it to you. <clears throat> Great, Alan. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? And can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Let me go to full screen mode. Um, so thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to present uh, this final framework plan. And um, I'd like to take about 80 minutes or so, um, 70 or 80 minutes. So it'll be... Um, a fairly deep dive into the into the plan. Um, but first of all, I wanted to say on behalf of Skidmore Owings and Merrill and our team, uh, thank you to the working groups uh, for all those hours that you've put in. We've benefited substantially from your input and um, I think the plan is absolutely uh, the better for it. Um, and I hope you'll find that we have um, responded to uh, many of the um, things that you uh, have asked for. So you should see on the screen um, what we call the illustrative plan. So this, um, this is an illustration of, of the uh, framework plan. Um, and just in terms of process, I will note that we, are, uh, we have finished what we call stage four. We're now in stage five which is um, purely a documentation phase. So we're, we're simply documenting the process. So what you'll see today is fairly uh, final, uh, but there are still a few ongoing, very minor adjustments. Um, and um, on the next page, uh, you'll see um, an aerial view here from the south um, east. So this is looking from, uh, the point of the mountain, uh, looking to the northwest. Um, and uh, just for, for clarification, um, you're seeing both buildings and parking structures in the plan. The buildings are the slightly whiter color. The um, uh, parking structures are the slightly more uh, grayish or toned uh, buildings. Um, a few things that I think we've talked about that, that I'd like to highlight, uh, uh, first and foremost, um, the BRT, which you can see coming through here on the dotted red line. Uh, we have two BRT stations, uh, the North BRT station here and the South BRT station uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, lower middle. Um, the river to range park has been a consistent uh, organizing feature for the project um, since um, early on in the process. Uh, you can see Porter Rockwell Boulevard from the lower left going up to the upper center of the project. This is a, a key design element as well, um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, but this view gives you a general sense of the overall um, uh, organization of the plan and, and the general building heights. Um, so the actual framework plan proper is shown here, and a framework plan is, is really a, a setting out of, of development parcels, roads, which are shown here in white, and then open space, obviously shown in green. The development parcels are in gray. So a few highlights. Again, you can see the BRT line in the magenta color. Uh, you can see the river to range park running through the 
middle of the project. The yellow line is uh, that river to range trail that we've uh, talked about connecting the Jordan River to the um, Wasatch Range uh, trail network. So that larger regional connection is an important part of the project. Um, and then there's um, seven districts, uh, which I'll talk about later. Each district is characterized by um, a district park. And then in the middle of the plan, uh, you can see Central Park. And this is really our mixed use uh, core area. So the BRT will come right into that mixed use core. Um, in terms of the detailed land use, um, the, I think one of the most exciting parts of the plan is the amount of variety that we have in the, in the land use plan. So this is very much a mixed use community. You can see on the left, uh, we have um, the, um, in blue, the office, uh, in red is more of the retail, uh, and then we have in yellow, the uh, residential. So this is definitely a mixed use community. You can also see the catchment areas shown in the dotted um, gray lines here from the BRT um, station. So this outer line is the 10 minute walk from the BRT. So um, about 80% of all the development will be within a 10 minute walk of BRT um, and 100% of the project will be within uh, a 15 minute walk of the project. Um, I do want to uh, just highlight a few um, numerical uh, details. Um, we have about 16 million square feet of um, development, which you can see here in the bottom. About 40% of the land area is devoted to residential and about 60% is devoted to um, non-residential. So that includes retail, office, and um, other functions, civic functions. The FAR, which is the proportion of buildings to land is uh, 1.06. Uh, so this would be considered a, a, a moderate density project. Um, and you can kind of see that in the uh, aerial here. So here's a view looking from the Northwest. So this is the opposite way. The building heights are generally in the, um, I would say the two to four story range on average, um, but many of uh, the parcels will have higher buildings up to uh, six stories. And in some cases in the core area, uh, they'll get up to 10 and, uh, even 12 or 15 stories. But the, those building heights are, are limited to areas that are supported by transit. Um, so one of the things we've really endeavored to do is uh, incorporate the key vision elements that you've so um, diligently developed. Um, so of course, these are the six that Alan touched on. And I just wanted to walk through some of the attributes of the plan relative to those key vision elements. And um, you may recall this slide from some of the workshops we've had. So we took the key vision element, we identified some principles, and then we tried to identify initiatives, specific actions or design um, ideas that would be implemented that would correlate with the principle and of course, then the key vision element. So community really was about, this idea of, of, of a mixed use community, um, healthy uh, living, being able to walk, uh, being uh, uh, close to jobs, uh, a jobs and housing balance. So it was really a fairly broad idea about a mixed use environment. And I think uh, we've uh, succeeded quite well in that. Um, so one of the features um, of the plan is this idea of a one car community. Um, and this idea that you can live here or work here, uh, and you, um, if you live here, you may only need one car uh, because most of the day-to-day -day services that you would require would be on site. So that would include retail, shopping, your job, um, transportation. So this is a, a key feature of, of the community uh, KVE. Um, another key feature, as I mentioned, is this balance between residential and office. And we created this generalized map of land use, which shows in yellow residential and in blue commercial. Uh, red is retail and uh, purple is civic. Um, but what this shows you is that this is truly a mixed use environment. And um, 
we can um, uh, achieve all of the objectives and initiatives that, that we talked about. So again, um, we will have a variety of residential types, a variety of job creation types, a school on site, and then some resident uh, retail as well. Um, one of those features is what we're calling a, a retail and entertainment destination. This really derived from the desire to have a more regional impact, that this is a place where people may um, come to spend an evening, maybe catch a show, uh, have dinner. So I think we've achieved that uh, in the central part of the plan. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, another um, idea is that we also have um, retail, not only in the core area, but also in the neighborhood. So you can see on the left side of this drawing, neighborhood retail. And then on the right side, we have district-based retail. So that would serve the office functions. The neighborhood retail would serve uh, the residential um, neighborhoods. And then the darker red in the core area would, would have a more of a um, uh, sub-regional impact. So it would actually serve people from offsite. So this is um, the retail strategy. We are also suggesting and, and has been agreed that we will have ground floor retail uh, on some of the blocks. Um, the idea behind the ground floor retail is uh, to provide um, a mix of uses on different parcels. So this is a picture of uh, a reference image for the Central Park that you can see we want the parcels next to the Central Park uh, to have um, cafes uh, and active, what we call active uses. So um, these are retail and, and food service uh, functions on the ground floor. And then also as part of the community idea, this idea of live work. Uh, so generally the residential, even though it's mixed, it'll be focused more on the Western half of the site. Uh, so this is where you'll really have the rich variety of, of uh, housing types of, uh, that will serve different workforce um, constituents, uh, different price points, uh, so that will then be complemented by a series of smaller open spaces and smaller parks to, again, extend this idea of community um, into the open space uh, network. So these are all features that have been uh, incorporated into that community um, KVE. The second uh, KVE is uh, transportation. I think this is where we had the most... Um, uh, the most uh, interesting conversations, really trying to push the envelope on, um, on the transportation ideas. This really is part and parcel and, and um, very much dependent on uh, land use to make it work. But we started with an idea of, of the 15 minute city and I've touched on this. And this is really a, an idea, not only about land use, but about transportation. So can everybody on the site get around the site without having to drive. Uh, and we think we have a plan that allows that to happen. Um, so 15 minute city simply refers to the idea that you can meet your daily needs within a 15 minute walk. And uh, that has been an organizing element of the plan since the very beginning. Another signature feature is these five minute districts. So um, within that 15 minute city, there's a series of smaller sub districts that have centers um, like the retail that I just mentioned, but also a, maybe an, an open space or a feature building or some sort of uh, organizing element for each district. So we have achieved that. Um, in terms of the transit master planning, um, there's a few really important elements here. One is of course the BRT with two stations and that 80 to 90% catchment within a 10 minute walk. Um, you'll also see here in yellow um, a circulator, um, which is essentially a um, potentially autonomous vehicle, but it's a smaller bus, um, probably an electric vehicle that would circulate through the site and connect to both BRT stations. So once you arrive at the site or want to leave the site by BRT, you can actually take that circulator uh, from any neighborhood and connect to BRT or take it to your job or your home. In orange, this sort of darker orange color, that's a second alternative um, for the circulator. And the idea there is that it 
rather than run in a loop fashion, um, it uh, runs through the open space. So it's a more linear organization for uh, the circulator. So we're actually going to enter into a more detailed study after the framework plan is complete about exactly the best uh, circulator option. Um, but the plan does incorporate both options uh, today. Um, the BRT we're very excited about. We've had numerous conversations um, with VTA um, and we uh, are planning on a very high standard for the design and operation of BRT. Um, the circulator might look something like this. Uh, again, it's a smaller vehicle, um, probably electric, uh, can carry six, eight, 10 or 12 passengers. Um, but what's nice about it just needs a little bit of a uh, travel path. Uh, so it doesn't require an extensive or very large travel path to uh, operate. Um, another key element of the transportation plan is, is this drawing, which shows um, trails, bike lanes, and um, what we call mobility nodes. So the trails are indicated in the orange color and the bike lanes are indicated in the blue color. Now these are designated and, and uh, delineated bike lanes. There will be bike accommodation on all streets, but these are actually marked bike lanes. And then where these two uh, systems intersect are, are what we're calling mobility nodes. So <clears throat> these are just simply places where the uh, micro mobility network of pedestrian and bike trails come together. So uh, the purpose and point of this um, design idea is to provide uh, ways for people to get around the site without having to drive or actually use any vehicle. Uh, so you can ride or bike and you can see that by the coverage of this diagram that it uh, will uh, provide access to every single parcel uh, on the project. Um, so we're very excited about this, the ability to move through the project uh, without having to be on a road and without having to be in a vehicle. Um, we also have a series of, uh, of pedestrian corridors. This image shows what those might look like. Um, these are simply greenways um, that are fairly narrow that's, that connect major parts of the plan together. Uh, again, no vehicles in these areas. So these are um, narrow um, linear um, greenways that link uh, key parts of the plan. Another goal for the transit um, for the transit element was to increase connectivity through the site, and um, that's been a request and a and a driver from from you for uh, since the beginning of the project. This has long been a prison site that's been isolated and cut off from the surrounding road network. So we actually have established um, potentially 14 new connections to the outside road grid, which you can see here in the red circles. The black lines indicate uh, automobile roads. Uh, and then what we're calling the pedestrian priority zone, which is the core area in the middle. This is an area that would have very limited vehicular access, uh, no through traffic uh, for vehicles. So it's really exactly what it says, a pedestrian priority zone. Uh, so we see this as a very safe um, area for um, children and people that may not be comfortable around uh, vehicles. And here's a, a little detail of that. The BRT stations are uh, part of that um, pedestrian priority zone as well. You can see the river to range park coming through the middle and then the central park um, here in the north. So that's, uh, I think, a very exciting element. Um, this is the master um, access plan. This is really just to indicate uh, intersection type and movements. Uh, this is um, really a technical drawing along with the detailed roadway plan. So one of the purpose is, of the framework plan is to establish some of the technical details uh, for uh, developer uh, information and, and also for implementation um, purposes. The third um, KVE we wanted to talk about was economic growth. And this is very important along with the innovation uh, KVE. Um, I think as we all know, the, 
the main purpose of, of this development project is to enhance Utah's economic uh, future. And uh, we want to uh, ensure that the project is this catalyst along the Wasatch Front. So as we've talked about before, it occupies this geographic position between the two major uh, urban centers uh, in the valley, uh, downtown Salt Lake, and then of course Provo. So this really becomes um, uh, sort of a third focal point in the valley in terms of concentration of new investment and uh, development. So um, a large part of the plan is devoted to um, this, this goal, this idea of creating new business and technology and innovation opportunities here. Over half the plan from a land use standpoint, 60%. Uh, is devoted to these types of uses. Um, so that is a signature feature. Um, as I mentioned, we do have an idea about uh, what we're calling districts. So these are um, sub areas within the plan that have specific characteristics, but also shared characteristics. So we have seven um, starting from the north, what we call the canal district. Uh, Wasatch district is the largest to the right. Uh, upper right. In the south, what we call the Ridge District, uh, which has an institutional focus. Uh, Wasatch is office and innovation and Canal District is focused on uh, really emerging technologies and research and development. The hub is the fourth one in the center of the project. This is a mixed use um, focus. And then the three on the left are primarily residential focus with differing densities. And you can see we've added here the approximate um, land area of each district and the approximate uh, residential units or uh, square footage. The um, idea of districts is then supported by density. Uh, so one of the requests and um, uh, goals was to support BRT with higher density. So you can see the darker color represents higher density that is focused in the core area and around BRT. Um, again, in terms of building heights, these are six, eight, 10 stories, maybe one or two buildings um, jumps up to 12 stories. Um, so this is really the core uh, of the project. Um, that's supported by uh, an idea of mixed use. I mentioned earlier that some parcels will have uh, two different functions on the parcel. So it might be office on the upper floors and retail on the ground floor or residential on the upper floors and retail on the ground floor. This is to support the idea of walkability, of meeting people's daily needs where they live and work. So the resident, the uh, orange color here shows the mixed use um, uh, parcels. The red indicates uh, the retail frontage. Um, as part of the economic development, we also want to have uh, a smart city framework. Um, so the um, uh, smart city framework is also organized around uh, the district strategy and the loop road that, that unites all of the districts together. You can see that in this a uh, purple line here in the in the middle. Um, we're also establishing um, a smart city hub, uh, which is also going to act as an intermodal hub. Um, that'll be on this uh, right at the northern BRT station. That can link to Salt Lake City digitally, and then of course to Draper and municipal assets uh, at the city level. Um, and then that would be complemented by a series of neighborhood hubs, which would be aligned with those mixed use parcels. Um, so the exact nature and, and function of these hubs um, is still to be determined. That'll be a, a, a next phase of work. But uh, the idea of a networked smart city um, a grid system and digital connectivity system has is, is been incorporated into the plan. And that includes a variety of components uh, such as these and um, will also include um, potentially different organizational options. Again, this will all be investigated in the next uh, phase. 
And the goal really is to align the KVEs, the smart city initiatives and the sustainable net uh, metrics into a, a, a virtuous cycle, uh, meaning that they support each other and reinforce each other. So we think we're on our way to achieving that. Um, the next uh, KVE is innovation. Um, and I do wanna say that the um, innovation KVE or goal really permeates the entire plan. And um, that includes how we think about um, uh, training, uh, how we think about uh, tenancy and what type of companies will come here, uh, as well as the actual economic activity within the plan. So uh, innovation has a, a few elements I'll touch on briefly. Um, one is this idea of an institutional and research presence. As I mentioned, in the Southern part of the uh, plan, uh, this district, the Ridge District has an institutional focus. And that's been a fairly consistent uh, design feature since the beginning of the project. Um, so we see this partnership extending to um, institutes of higher education, as well as potentially community colleges, a whole variety of, of uh, ways that we can bring in that institutional idea. Um, I had mentioned um, R&D and this cross industry idea um, that will be focused around the South BRT station. Um, we're calling that our innovation hub, um, but we'll also include that Northern district called the Canal District, which is more of an R&D focus. Um, so even though the whole plan will have an innovation overlay, there will be a few portions of the plan that are specifically targeted for companies that want to pursue that mission. Um, and that will include a variety of building types, can be um, academic, can be research driven, it can be um, more manufacturing based. Uh, so uh, we will be developing some architectural guidelines um, for uh, the different building types uh, in the future. And then of course we have um, uh, some civic uses that are part of that innovation uh, overlay. Uh, so we are showing a, a, a potential K through eight um, school here on the Western half of the project, centrally located in the residential area, but also adjacent to the river range, a river to range park. Um, the institutional parcels uh, have been targeted for the Southern edge, even though the whole uh, Ridge district will have an institutional overlay, but um, these two parcels in particular would, would have a lot of capacity. Um, there is an existing fire academy on the site that will remain. Um, and so we really see these as um, opportunities to bring um, uh, training opportunities, educational opportunities into the site and expand that innovation uh, mission. And then we also want the innovation to extend to the actual physical um, construction of the project. So we want the project to demonstrate innovation in how it's built. Uh, so to that end, we are um, looking at this idea of a pedestrian priority zone, the green corridors that I talked about, the uh, trail networks, all of these features, these physical attributes of the project um, will contribute to that idea of innovation. Um, and then we will be developing design guidelines to ensure that um, some of these ideas are um, memorialized, um, but also um, required as people move forward into the um, construction. That will include the public realm. We think the public realm, the street environment, the park environment, the signage, that will all be extremely important in terms of how this idea of innovation and uh, design quality is, is implemented uh, as we move forward into um, construction. And then um, one of the specific elements we've talked about in our discussions with you is the idea of green infrastructure. We know that water um, conservation is extremely important and we've designed a plan that has extensive green infrastructure components. Um, 
but that really will be, I think, a demonstration um, for the region of how we can build uh, large-scale projects um, in a more sustainable and, and um, environmentally responsible manner. The next um, KVE was sustainability. Uh, we uh, had a long and many um, detailed conversations on sustainability. Um, working with our sustainability team, we did identify um, some specifics about where we wanna go with sustainability. And I think the overall message that this really is a unique opportunity to um, be a leader uh, regionally, nationally, and potentially globally um, on sustainability, especially in this type of environment, an arid uh, high mountain region, or sorry, high plains region where certain resources are um, more, um, uh, need to be conserved in a more aggressive way. Um, so the sustainability plan for the project has five components. And this has evolved from conversations with you, uh, mobility, ecology, energy and carbon, water and waste. The first two really have to do with quality of life and the second three have to do with resource utilization. Um, with these five components, we've identified four or three or four sub what we call elements um, to each of those. So mobility is actually comprised of these four elements. Uh, demand management, meaning uh, reducing the amount of um, travel demand uh, by vehicles, bike and walk, transit, and electrical vehicles. And we believe that the net, uh, the sum of these actions will result in a, approximately a 50% carbon reduction over uh, what we call business as usual compared to other large master plans. Um, so for mobility, we're seeing um, uh, these five uh, outcomes. So we're, we anticipate about one third reduction in vehicle miles traveled. 100% of all residents and workers will be within uh, one block of a trail or bikeway. And 100% of people will be within a five minute walk of either the circulator or BRT. We're aiming for 10,000 electric vehicle charging stations by, ten, uh, by year 10. And as I mentioned, that results in about a 50% reduction in carbon. In terms of ecology, we focused on these three elements. So open space, um, access to open space and habitat creation. And um, we believe that these results in these significant improvements in terms of uh, carbon and biodiversity. Uh, so the outcomes for our ecological sustainability, um, we have over 200 acres of parks and open space uh, when you factor in parcel-based open space. 100% of people will be within a two minute walk of a park or an open space. About 50% of our open space, we're imagining um, what we call um, micro wilderness or more naturalized landscape. The other 50% would be um, more functional landscape. So sports fields, activities, things like that. But we hope to have a fair, hot, fairly high degree of, of habitat creation. Um, and we believe this will result in about a 25% increase in carbon sequestration over a project of uh, similar scale and size. The fourth um, one is energy and carbon. Uh, there's four elements to this. And um, we think this also has significant benefits. This will mostly be propagated down to the building scale, uh, but we think the outcomes here will be about 50% less operational carbon in buildings and about 20% less embodied carbon in buildings. So that will really be part of the guidelines and part of the detailed uh, implementation of the um, sustainability plan. Water, uh, we've looked at three elements, surface hydrology, uh, use efficiency, and then reuse um, with these targets uh, over on the right. The outcomes from this sustainable strategy, we believe we can um, filter 100% of the surface runoff from um, impervious surfaces such as roads and parking. 
Um, we believe we can achieve about a 40% reduction in indoor water use. And we're hoping that we can um, collect and planning on collecting 100% of rainwater for reuse, whether that's irrigation or other functions. Um, waste uh, really has to do with uh, recycling and resource utilization. Um, the outcomes on this element would be, we're aiming for a 50% recycling rate and 75% construction waste uh, diversion. In terms of the um, cost benefit, um, we have looked at these generally in terms of cost benefit. Um, so the, the highest benefit um, sustainable strategies are shown more to the right of this uh, diagram. The ones that require further study or will be deferred to um, later stages or detailed stages are shown more to the left. Um, and then the relative cost of, of the sustainable strategies, again, we're still, um, that will be part of a later study, but we believe that um, many of these that can be done in the near term have relatively low cost. And in other words, they're built into the plan, which uh, means that they are uh, easy to implement. They'll just be an intrinsic part of the master plan. Um, the final one we want to talk about is this idea of collaboration. Um, so uh, this really had to do with how we're impacting or leading regionally, how we're connecting outward from the project. One of the features we've really tried to focus on is this idea of uniquely Utah, this idea of connecting Utah's communities and respecting uh, Utah's ecosystems. And we think that we've uh, done that fairly well. Also this idea of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, connected to the history of, of Utah. Um, so the actual physical structure of the plan is, is derived from the original plat of Zion for Salt Lake City, this 800 by 800 foot macro grid that then was subdivided into smaller parcels, which you can see on the right. The reason we subdivide it into smaller blocks is to uh, achieve that idea of porosity, meaning be, people being able to move through the plan easily. And that's done with either roads, bikeways, or those pedestrian connections we talked about. In terms of other types of external um, features, the river to range trail um, will extend and complete, a, I, I think, a regional trail system that's incredibly important, this idea of linking the river to the mountain system. Um, a second one is respecting and conserving our water resources. So understanding how water will move across the site and uh, making plans to conserve as much of that as possible through this idea of wetlands um, and park system that um, is not just for active or recreational purposes, but has this functional purpose. Um, we also looked at, um, uh, connections visually to the region. So this is a diagram showing our connections to some of the big mountains, both to the east and west. And we've actually made some adjustments in the last stage uh, to incorporate these views and uh, designed what we call view windows that focus people's view from the site outward to the mountains. Um, so uh, focusing on key peaks that are adjacent to the um, to the site. The open space plan is shown here. We've got about 142.5 acres of public open space. Um, and this is about 23% uh, of the project area, I believe. Uh, you can see some of the features here. Again, the idea is uh, an interconnected network of open spaces, but with a, a few key focal points. And you can see the key focal points here, the central park in the center of the project, the river to range, the Wasatch District Park, um, which is in the upper right, and then the smaller squares represent neighborhood parks. And then those window parks that I just mentioned that open up to the east and west, you can see them here on the left-hand side, and there's three of them on the right-hand side. 
So lots of little nuances and details that we think are going to be incredibly exciting. We have included what we call a sports park or community park um, that has a specific um, active recreation function, sports fields. That has um, uh, that will be about eight acres in size. And here you see some images of, of how those open spaces may look, um, both the primary and secondary, the linear systems, the bikeways. Uh, so this gives you a sense of what we're aiming for in terms of the uh, final design. Um, and then a couple last, oh, sorry about that. A uh, couple last views of the, of the site. Let me go back one. Um, so again, the, um, here you see the site from the north uh, east. Uh, so you see that Wasatch district here in the foreground. This is primarily our office district, the canal district, uh, mixed use, but has a uh, R&D and product development focus, the ridge district here to the south, adjacent to the big point of the mountain ridge, and then the Western uh, neighborhoods uh, here, which are primarily residential. The big green uh, corridor here is a power line easement that, that is, uh, cannot be changed. Uh, so that's a feature. And then um, just stepping back a little bit, I apologize for the resolution on this, but you can see the Jordan River Parkway in the background. So you can see a little bit more of how it fits into the larger context. And then here's from the Northwest. So looking the opposite direction. So we think it really fits well into the context. You can see the, the density is generally a little bit higher than what's around it. Uh, the site coverage in terms of developments a little bit greater, um, but we really need that sort of um, design idea to achieve some of the objectives that we've talked about. And then I wanted to, um, finish on a couple things. Uh, the districts, just to walk through those in a little more detail. Um, again, uh, each of them have both shared characteristics as well as unique characteristics. Um, and um, generally they're in the range of about 50 acres up to the Wasatch District is the largest at 122. Um, so these can also be um, part of different phasing strategies. They're meant to function. Um, essentially as um, distinct um, developments almost on their own if, if necessary. Um, so that lets us uh, have a phasing strategy that is uh, manageable. Um, so this is a detailed view of the hub area and just to get everyone oriented, the um, Porter Rockwell Boulevard is shown here on the left. The River to Range Park comes through the middle. This is the South BRT station here at the lower center. Um, the repurposed prison buildings are these three buildings uh, here. Currently we're planning on uh, potentially reusing um, key aspects of the prison site. Um, hopefully these three uh, buildings in particular, maybe some additional ones, we're still working through that. Um, you can see the Central Park in the middle here. Uh, and then this lifestyle commercial area or retail entertainment hub is, is the middle. And then surrounding that is uh, mixed use. And you can see some of these buildings here are getting up to, as I mentioned, 10, 12 stories. Um, so this is really the core area. Um, and I think it gives you a sense of the scale of this project to see these detailed views, because you can really see the the number of floors in the buildings and sort of the details of the street areas. Um, another district, um, oh, this is a cross section through the River to Range uh, Park. So you can see the hub areas adjacent to that. Um, we are hoping to do some, some grading that allows that stormwater to move into the River to Range Park. Uh, so it has that purpose uh, as well. The um, some other districts um, that we uh, have designed. This is running a little bit slow. Um, this is the canal district looking from uh, the north. So this is Bangor Highway here in the bottom, very bottom of the um, 
image looking south, uh, a little bit southeast. You can see the Central Park there in the in the upper part of the plan, uh, Porter Rockwell going through. Um, so this is what you would experience if you entered the project from the north. Uh, so we have slightly lower buildings um, in the northern uh, districts um, because of the type of um, commercial activity that would be going on there. And uh, this is an example of some of those building heights. Um, uh, again, this has more of a manufacturing R&D focus um, in the canal district, but would be supported by some residential. Um, the Ridge District, um, again, organized around a park in the middle. Uh, here you see I-15. So now we're looking from the south, uh, south southeast, uh, Porter Rockwell Boulevard on the left. So this is what you would see um, if you were uh, approaching the site from the south. Those two big institutional parcels I mentioned are shown here in the foreground. You can get a sense of the number of buildings and, and scale of those two parcels. And then what we call the Ridge Park, which is in the center here. So again, this is a district park that would organize the district. It's right adjacent to the canal, uh, which is a little bit difficult to see in this, in this view. Um, a few last districts I'll, I'll show you, and then we can wrap up uh, the South uh, River District. So now we're again in the South, but more on the Southwest side. So you can see Puerto Rockwell Boulevard on the right. Here's the um, utility easement on the left. We're thinking this is community gardens underneath the utility easement. Um, and this, again, primarily residential in nature, um, but there is the South River Park there in the middle of the image. And then the very Western edge of the project, you can see the um, front runner tracks here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, the utility easement, uh, the community park to the North and the river to range park. Um, this is our lowest density residential area. So this will be townhomes, um, uh, garden apartments, things like that, generally in the three to four uh, story range. Again, organized around a major community park, neighborhood park here in the middle. And um, finally, the North uh, River District. So the school, again, shown there in the middle and the sports park here in the uh, foreground with Porter Rockwell on the left-hand side. And um, finally, the Wasatch District, which is uh, our premier office district. Um, so here you see I-15 in the uh, right foreground. The blue triangles represent those view windows to the east. So these will be openings uh, in the plan that allow people that are in the district to see out to the Wasatch Range. Um, we'll have a substantial uh, park here in, uh, in the middle of the Wasatch District. This will be primarily oriented towards headquarters office, um, larger tenants that want more uh, land area. And we've, it's also been designed in a way that one user can, can aggregate two or three parcels together, uh, potentially developing a mini campus um, in, the, in the project. The South BRT station is shown here on the left. So that's within a five to 10 minute walk of most of the Wasatch district. And then you have the North BRT station in the upper left. Um, so very accessible uh, by either BRT or automobile. And um, in terms of the architectural identity, um, the Wasatch District will be characterized by, you know, very well done um, buildings. Uh, parking will be screened typically behind um, the buildings. Uh, we've made a commitment to putting buildings on the street, holding that street edge. Parking is generally screened uh, from view. And then um, last thing I wanted to touch on is the phasing strategy. And um, 
we are currently looking at a variety of different phasing options, um, but um, generally it falls into two categories, uh, what we call alternative A, which is shown as starting the project in the south, and alternative B, which is shown starting the project in the north. Each of these have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, the idea is to have uh, a representative sample of all the land uses in the in phase one, whether it's alternative A or B, um, and uh, have a critical mass of retail, residential, and office. Um, so again, alternative A starting from the south, uh, you can see where phase one would go, and then we would essentially work outward from that phase one, bringing in different parts of the plan, depending on market demand and um, development capacity. You can see over here on the left, the approximate amount of square footage that would be developed in each phase. And then alternative B, um, again, starting from the north uh, and then growing outward uh, from that phase one starting point. We, we do hope that part of the river to range or a significant part of the river to range park as well as the central park might be a part of phase one. So there would be a community benefit early on uh, in the development of the project. So um, these are the two alternatives. Um, and again, this is still going through a bit of refinement here as we wrap up the project, um, but we will have um, clear phasing alternatives. Um, and the cost, uh, approximate cost of those phasing alternatives. So that is the framework plan. Um, we're very happy with where we've gotten to in the last seven months. Again, thank you all for your contributions. Um, we literally couldn't have done it without the guidance um, that you've provided. and. Um, there's still a ways to go to get to built, built outcomes, but we feel like this is a very, very good um, first um, delineation of, of what this project could be. Um, and Alan, I think I will pause there. I can go a little deeper on some of the parks uh, if we'd like. Um, I do have a separate section on uh, open space if if that's of interest i think well, i've been yeah, I th Pete, yeah let's let's pause here uh, okay our, our participants have asked a number of questions in the chat and I okay some have uh, been answered but let's go through and make sure that we we cover those maybe before we move on and if we've got time we'll get into the uh, the park planning um so Andrew asked first, what's the size or acreage of the Central Park? Uh, yeah, the Central Park, I believe, is um, I believe it's about five acres. Let me um, let me jump to that page. Uh, hold on. Apologize, my screen is. Things are running a little bit slow here. Um, and I can also answer the next one, which is about parking. Right. So I, I'll just mention that in when we look at the Central Park, we looked at some analogs around the country, some of the, the major parks in uh, New York and uh, in surrounding communities and tried to find a, a scale that would be appropriate for kind of this hub area and provide a range of uses. Can you see this Central Park uh, slide? Yes. Yeah, so I, I misspoke, it's uh, 6.8 acres. And um, as part of the framework plan, we have developed very conceptual plans for each of the parks, which you can see here. You can see the building footprints also, so gives you an idea of the relative scale. 
we are still in the process of adjusting the amount of green area versus the amount of programmed or hard surface. Um, we are anticipating to make the event lawn larger, um, but this gives you a sense of, of the, some of the ideas that we're working with. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Next question, what's the approach for parking? key to the success of this enterprise? Yeah, parking is, um, I would say there's two, um, let me jump to the Wasatch District uh, view because I think that's a good example. Um, so one is um, the phasing and build out. So the idea is that uh, in the early stages when maybe there's, um, slightly lower densities, or maybe someone hasn't fully built out their parcel, the parking will occur on, um, it could occur on the ground. Uh, so it would be surface parking. Um, as the parcel gets built out, as you can see in this um, Wasatch district view, sorry, um, as the parcel gets built out, the parking will be consolidated. So this is a typical parking structure right here. Um, and that parking structure serves these three buildings. And as I mentioned, it's generally screened from view. So it's screened from these two major streets. Um, but these are uh, structured parking decks that are generally about five stories in height. And that was our working um, uh, sort of parameter or design guide for ourselves. We didn't, we didn't want to show any parking structures over five stories. Um, but how, how an individual parcel developer chooses to incorporate parking is, um, will be controlled to some degree, but they will have some flexibility about how to do it. So they could, they could build on top of their parking if they want. They could screen it in other ways. They could, in the early phases, have surface parking and later go to structured. But what we'll be um, directing them on are the location and the screening requirements for parking um, to some degree. I got to add a little bit, um, Peter. Sure. Um, I, I think in our early phases, there are going to be some areas that in order to achieve the character that we're trying to achieve, you know, a, you know, good place making, you know, some good strong kind of urbanism that uh, is attractive to our target markets. You know, it, we're going to need to figure out how to get some structured parking in. And uh, some of that structured parking, it might be somewhat difficult for the market to completely support it. And so we need to think about how to, uh, how to help, you know, urbanize parking in key locations, whereas other locations in the early phases that'll be less essential. And we think it can be surface parked as, and as Peter described, intensified uh, at a later date. Thank you. Um, another question, what's the intention behind blending the use of the school with the fire center? Uh, I don't think there is an intention to blend them. Uh, there's an existing Northern Utah interagency fire center along the frontage road on the east side of the project. Uh, we are in conversations with uh, Draper City, make sure that we can provide necessarily pub necessary public safety features and, and facilities on the site. So uh, the location hasn't been determined. It'll be based on response times and other factors. So at this point, there's no intention to blend the school and any fire facilities. Um, Another question, can you elaborate more on the potential front runner station on the west side? And if that were to happen, how does it alter the plan? And this is a, a good question. In a number of the conversations we've had with you as a group, you've indicated that it would be ideal if we could have uh, additional transit on the site and the front runner station there. It's not in the plans. It's probably not anything that can happen anytime soon because uh, the area is so close to the Draper Front Runner Station, but uh, just based on, on uh, the possibility that there might be future need, we built it in there and at a place along that river to range 
trail and open space so that that could accommodate future access to that site without having to change the plan dramatically. But uh, as I said, there, there is uh, no plan for that now. And the UTA is not entertaining actively. Uh, but we just said it's something to consider in the distant future. Um, yeah, Alan, I would just add on that point, we, we did extend the circulator up to the, um, to the very northwest corner of, of the site in one of the options with the idea that if in the future there's a um, station here, uh, we've also created this view window here and a road link to this upper corner so that if anything does ever happen at this northwest corner around a front runner, that, that, pl that the plan already, the plan's ready for it. And it goes to that concept that we've talked about where this is a plan that will provide us direction and help make decisions and take the next steps. But the watchword's been flexibility to yeah. construct it in a way that can accommodate changes in the future. Uh, next, the anticipated internal capture from the site. What is it? And uh, the amount of trips coming to the site at peak uh, transit and vehicles. You have that Pete or is Ryan on? I'm not sure if Ryan yeah. is on. Yeah. I'm on. Can you hear me? Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, so it, great question, Grant. It, as we've looked at the internal capture on a couple of these different alternatives that we've looked at, uh, we've had a lot of opportunity to go back and forth looking at the mix of uses and how the internal capture would work. I've asked Josh to go in and look it up and see if he's got uh, the latest and greatest. So I'll turn some time over to Josh and let him go through that. Thanks, Ryan. So on a peak hour reduction, uh, the number we came to in the final concept was nearly 14% internal capture. Um, this was using um, the EPA methodology uh, developed in, in conjunction with the University of Utah. So nearly 14% internal capture. Transit, we had a 5% uh, reduction approximately. Um, after those reductions, we, we anticipate in the peak hour, we'd have about uh, 11,500 vehicle trips uh, in and out total. So. Great, thank you. So those are conversations that we continue to have with the transportation agencies to see if uh, what kind of refinements might be necessary to make sure this works well. Uh, question about water rights, what uh, the, the facility has access to and whether we need more. There are water rights associated with the current operations at the site. And so the state does own water rights. Um, we uh, are going to be getting the, the water though through the city and under contract with Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District. So uh, we've talked to them, uh, they've got anticipated water for the site. We'll be working on uh, sizing of infrastructure, phasing, and uh, the various other technical aspects of ensuring that the water comes at the right time. But uh, yeah, the state does have uh, water rights uh, for the current use and, and a little bit more. Question, uh, love to hear how the approach to supply and management of parking relates to the one car household and 15 minute city model. Uh, any comments on that, Pete or Steve or others? Yeah, I, well, I, can, I yeah, Steve, go ahead. Well, I'll just jump in and, and just, add a little color, you know, to that concept. And the idea is that um, it's kind of trying to answer the question is that wouldn't it be great if, you know, a, a family can move in with that, you know, as two incomes and, but, but is able to live with only one owner, only owning one car. Uh, and that helps everybody, right? I mean, it helps them economically. It helps the project by ultimately requiring less parking. But in order to do that, you need to create an environment that's extremely supportive in terms of other alternatives of mo mo uh, mobility. And so the idea of the trail system, the idea of mobility hubs, the idea of a car share, 
the idea of the circulator, let alone the BRT. And of course, the whole idea of, of having a relative balance of jobs and housing so that people have the choice. If you want to, and you live in the region, there is a place, you know, uh, other than maybe downtown and a few other places where you could live and work in the same district within walking distance of each other. And of course, that's the biggest idea in terms of, of being able to ha only have to own one car. So uh, we've, we've um, exposed this idea to, uh, you know, the development community. And I think everybody, I mean, they're all very supportive of it, but they also are a little bit cautious when they say, you know, that this is a, a, uh, a change, a cultural change that takes time. And you're going to have to demonstrate, you know, to the market that, that it actually works, you know, that we actually do have these systems and mobility that actually is functional and actually does allow you to uh, live here with, with uh, less than, than two car ownership. And so, you know, don't expect it to happen overnight. And, uh, uh, and anyway, so that's the idea. And I, I think one of the things we're doing in a uh, subsequent study, a more detailed study is looking at, micro mobility and looking at progressive mobility systems and really truth testing those to see, you know, what do we really need? You know, how much can we afford? Because so these things aren't cheap, you know, they, they do cost and we only have so much, you know, economic uh, freeboard, you know, in the project. Uh, and so that over the next couple of months, we'll be drilling down deeper on this, uh, on this concept. Thank you. Um, it's an important question uh, about our neighbors. So you've got uh, two Bluffdale neighborhoods that are close to the site, uh, too close to use other public transportation, too far away for walking because uh, of railroad tracks, canal, other barriers. How can they be integrated into and, and access the site? And this is something that we've uh, talked about. We've had conversations with Bluffdale about creating a better access. It's a challenge because uh, we don't have, we don't own the property uh, adjacent to those areas. But uh, any comments on on that piece? Well, I think um, connecting to the single family neighborhood immediately to the west will be a little bit challenging because of the railroad tracks. Um, we're hoping uh, and we imagine they could um, access the project through the Jordan River Parkway system, trail system, and then of course come in on the bridge into the river to range park. So with a, it's a little bit circuitous, but with a short five minute bike ride, you could potentially be into the project. Um, I think to the South, there's the most potential. I know there's other larger developments a little bit off this map, uh, that are residential. We have proposed extending uh, the road network down to 146 South. Uh, we've aligned it with um, existing roads where possible. So we're trying to rebuild and reconnect that road network. So um, that may lead to additional bike trails. It may lead to additional bus connections to um, surrounding neighborhoods, but yeah, we'd be very interested in making those connections. And then I think finally, the canal trail, um, which we would like and have talked to the canal company about extending onto the site through the site and then connecting into the Bluffdale trail system, that would be a third, a third um, means to, to move north, um, north and south uh, in this area. And there, uh, I'll just say there are some conversations going on about uh, an external circulator, some of the other property owners interested in doing something that would connect uh, these neighborhoods and you know, potentially down into the Thanksgiving Point area as well, so that you're, again, have another transit option keeping people off the, off of the, the roads. So it's, Debbie, it's a, it's a challenge. It's one that we are aware of, uh, concerned about, looking for strategies, uh, limited amount that we can do given some of the the barriers in ownership and, and the physical barriers of the railroad, but uh, one that we continue to, to try to solve. Um, Sarah, how did you land on the 50% reduction carbon emissions for buildings? Uh, we could perhaps be more ambitious. 
uh, you know, it's a, it's a great comment. Uh, we are shooting for net zero in terms of carbon with on-site generation, et cetera. As you saw in one of the subsequent slides, that's sort of a, a placeholder and it was in the category of needing further study. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we, we are gonna be doing uh, further study on the sustainability plan and essentially outlining kind of a good, better, best approach and what the associated costs are so that the board can then make informed decisions about how to, to spend limited resources based on you know, the limited land value of this property uh, to create the greatest public good in a, a thoughtful and fiscally prudent way. So um, look at that 50% as uh, a goal at this point, but kind of a placeholder. And Mike Kathleen makes the, the point, the Plat of Zion blocks were 660 by 660. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's the net block size. We were, I was speaking more about the center line to center line dimension. Right. Um, uh, endorsement of the idea of repurposing some of the historical buildings. Let's see, uh, question from Reed. Uh, how is travel demand by different modes and internal capture forecasted? Could that be why carbon reduction wasn't higher? Um, recall that we're shooting for a larger carbon reduction by 2050, 80% is thrown around. Yeah, Pete, there is a, there is a slide that uh, in your deliverable, and it's probably not in this deck, that uh, breaks down the reductions uh, by strategy. Um, and um, yeah. one of the things, one, the, the, the um, sort of MXD modeling read that you're very familiar with uh, ended up with about a 27% reduction based on uh, land use uh, mix and, and proximity, which was a little bit less than what we were hoping for. Uh, and then on top of that, there were a series of other, you know, transit and um, uh, active mobility and a series of other uh, components. And, and um, it could be that uh, Ryan, you know, maybe he wants to, he has those numbers at his fingertips. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I think Josh had those up on his screen. I may let Josh respond to some of those. But Reed, what we did find is that in, in looking at uh, the mixed use internal capture, uh, we took advantage of the best we could on the reduction. Um, we weren't finding reductions up in the 50% range, but I think they were, they were uh, quite a bit lower and felt to be reasonable for what we were looking at. Yeah, and just to clarify some of those numbers, I, I think the, on a previous alternative, we had around 27% total on the reduction. Um, currently, we're at 26.1% uh, total. That's a daily reduction. The total reduction for peak hour is 23.7%. And that does already include internal capture, transit, active mobility. So that's, that's the number we ended up with. So Josh, just uh, MXD on its own, just the uh, land use mix interaction, what was that number? That was the, on a peak hour, peak hour basis, 13.7%. On a daily, it came out to be 16.5. That's the internal capture because of mix of uses, so. Yeah, that's kind of lower than what I, I know I was hoping for, but that's one of the reasons the numbers are a little low. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> yeah, would have expected a, a larger uh, rate of internal capture. Uh, and then when you include the, um, the walking and, and biking and so on, um, transit use, uh, I would have been hope, I would have also hoped for a, a larger percentage reduction, getting you closer to the, you know, the kind of the, the carbon targets that have been set uh, by many states for, for 2050 or, or thereabouts. Agree. Yep. I think we all uh, we're, we're shooting for more, and that's that's kind of where the numbers came. Maybe out. we just maybe we need to to use a twenty four volt battery than a twelve rather than a twelve volt battery on the model or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that's something again that um, we're we're turning the dials and trying to 
maximize more. Question about the total percent of open space. I think that can be uh, determined in a couple of ways. If you look at total open space, public and private, it's about 200 acres out of the 600, so about a third of it. If you look at just public open space, it's 142.5 acres, so uh, just over 23%. Um, and for context, that's more acreage than you have in uh, Sugar House Park. Let's see. Um, regardless of phasing approach, what is an anticipated realistic time frame? Uh, I think if we look to full build out, it's hard to say course depends on the market and there will be cycles uh, during the, the build out of this area but I think we're looking at at least uh, 20 years probably uh, but again it's, it's hard to gauge without knowing what's going to happen in economic cycles but this is a this is a long-term project as we've said in the past it's more important to us to do it right than to do it fast and so if we can uh, phase it and build it out in a way that increases value so that we can better afford the parking solutions, some of the other amenities, then it makes sense to, to slow the process a little bit so that infrastructure can keep up. Um, Jake asks, will the circulator be on its own pathway or shared? Which phase would start first? And kind of depends on our alternatives, but uh, Pete, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, the circulator would always be on a dedicated pathway um, that's for safety reasons and also for operational efficiency. Fortunately, the pathway doesn't need to be very wide, um, probably about uh, no more than 10 feet, could even be narrower than that, eight feet. Um, and when two circulators pass, pass each other, we can have it slightly wider, almost like a train uh, passes another train. Um, in terms of phase, I'm not sure I understand the question, um, which phase of the circulator or which phase of the project. Um, I would imagine, Steve, uh, that we would have a circulator at least in a testing mode early on in the project. Um, I think that would be part of the, say, the river to range. Uh, to begin to see how it works, see see what uh, vehicles we want to use, what what's the operational characteristics of the circulator. I would agree that would be a goal. If it depends on the the ultimate size and character of the first phase. But. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we share this presentation? Uh, we can at the right time. I think we don't want to. You know, kind of step on our public announcement. And so probably wait until after the public announcement and then we can share all of this information. And it'll certainly be on the website and we wanna make sure that it's uh, available to all. Uh, next, how will structured parking be financed? A number of options here, but Steve, do you wanna take the first cut at that? Well, um... We're, we're hoping that in most cases it's, it's fine. They're financed by the project, you know, that is uh, an, in which it, that it's serving, you know, that the market can support uh, the structured parking. We know that our higher dense residential densities that we're proposing for the first couple phases should be able to support structured parking. We're hoping that uh, some of the early office projects, uh, some might be surface parks, some that are closer into the first phase of the core. Uh, would be supportable by market uh, forces if we can achieve a certain level of shared parking. That's what we found on these types of projects, mixed use projects that, that sometimes structured parking doesn't make sense if you're building an office building out in a cornfield, but if you put it next to cinema and you put it next to entertainment and you put it next to other uses, there's enough of a sharing dynamic that the shared cost allows the structured parking to be uh, economically, you know, supportable. So we're, we're definitely shooting for that concept. Uh, for the retail, it's going to be a little bit harder, you know, and that's where we need to be creative. And we might need some uh, TIF financing or uh, an assessment district or some other sort of uh, supportive move to, uh, to get some of that in. But we're hoping that that is a very strategic 
you know, tactical uh, requirement in, in, in only in key locations and represents a fairly small percentage of the total parking. We have talked to the development community about doing parking districts and having uh, satellite parking structures that serve multiple uh, users. We got a fairly cold reception to that idea. Um, and so we've been less aggressive on that, uh, mainly because they feel that, uh, especially in these early phases, that the market is going to want uh, fairly immediate, you know, convenient parking. And that also when they go for financing, a project, especially in a new project, that uh, sort of remote dislocated parking that is not controlled by the uh, developer uh, or the project uh, tenants uh, is harder to finance. So there's some, I, I think it's not an idea that we, we want to completely, uh, re, you know, not pursue at some point, but in the early stages, it's, we're probably going to do less of the uh, parking district idea. Yeah, and that kind of answered the, the next question as well. So um, this is one that, that uh, we've been spending a lot of time on with our board, the method to execute the development. Will the state maintain some control on development or will there be RFPs or will segments simply be sold off to developers with certain parameters imposed on the intended development? What are the current thoughts on executing against this plan? Steve, you wanna share where we are at this point on that? Well, definitely, uh, I think it's paramount and a requirement that the state maintains control of the project. Uh, we were looking at multiple models of uh, land disposition, uh, but they all have the uh, state uh, having authority over deci prime key decisions, land use decisions, uh, project character, and urban design decisions and so forth. On the other hand, uh, for the project to be successful, the master developers are going to have to take this framework plan and, and, and dare I say, recreate it in their own image. In other words, you know, uh, develop more detailed planning solutions that they believe have refined product mixes, product relationships, parking solutions that they believe, you know, they can deliver, you know, and be successful, you know, in the marketplace. And, it's, and it's, they need to be able to do that to make the economics, you know, of the project work. So you have those two kind of by those two ends of the dumbbell in the middle lies a delivery system uh, that would, would have this, the uh, state, the authority uh, controlling phasing, controlling land use programming, identifying areas that, uh, that for the first phase development would probably be mostly um, developed by a single master developer. Uh, and then uh, in order to get all the parts the, the Swiss watch to be working together uh, with the opportunity for other projects, outlying projects from that first phase master development to occur. Uh, for instance, if key, uh, you know, corporate headquarters or innovation, the university, others want to come in and, 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 and develop a, a, a component, uh, that option will still, still be there, but it will need to be coordinated uh, with the uh, phase one master developer so that it all kind of, you know, the, the, the puzzle, all the, all the pieces uh, interlink. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And I'll just add that uh, it's important that we have the legal structures in place to maintain the control so we get the outcomes that are represented in this vision. So we'll be looking at development agreements and um, mechanisms on land ownership, you know, moving from leasing to fee simple and other things that create the inducements and the legal requirements that uh, the vision be accomplished. Uh, next, will irrigation be secondary water and metered at each location for conservation tracking? I think we, we uh, do believe that we'd be looking at secondary water, but, um, and, and Draper is working on a secondary system right now. Uh, we haven't gotten to that, that level of detail though, but I think uh, we all recognize uh, metering makes a big difference. Uh, studies around the state have shown that putting meters on without any other changes reduced water use by about 30%. So uh, we think that it's an important strategy. Uh, I want to hear what they say about the process of developing the regulatory plan 
rephrased, what is the process for developing the regulatory plan? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that is by regulatory, uh, is that sort of the, the zoning analog? Ted, could you explain that a little bit more? Well, I, I think I think what we're talking about here, and we, we've discussed this, and that is, you know, uh, in as much as we have a framework plan and so forth, that that over time there needs to be a specific plan, a land use plan or a zoning diagram. Typically, it would be in the form of a specific plan. In other in other cities, they would use that term, that kind of locks in, you know, the underlying land uses and circulation backbones, uh, so that as the project. Um, ships over into uh, the city of Draper, uh, there is a uh, uh, underlying uh, regulatory document that, that uh, documents you know, the fundamental land use and densities and, uh, and, and so forth. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece that we know is, needs to be developed at some point. Uh, and we're kind of, we've kind of been waiting for the framework plan to get the dust to die down before we start to go into that, uh, that, that next step. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and a, a statement, no TIF financing to support retail. Uh, that's, that's not in the plans. It'd be for shared infrastructure for public benefit. And then uh, uh, a plea for no TIF for residential. And uh, that hasn't been uh, under consideration at all. So thank you. Those are, those are terrific questions and uh, good input. Anything else before we head to wrap up? Question, Alan. Which do you think would be phase one? Where where would the project actually start? If if you could pin something on a map, and if you don't have that answer, that's fine too. But I think we're all excited, and we'd love to kind of see what that first phase would be, and where it would be. Yeah, you saw that there's a, a phasing plan that we shared earlier, and there were two areas: an alternative A and an alternative B where that might start. One uh, further south, which has better visibility and probably works a little bit better with access and, and uh, an alternative to the north that has existing infrastructure that might be uh, less expensive in the first phase. So we're still working through the pros and cons of each. You can see there the, on the screen those alternatives. All right, um, Pete, could you just in maybe three minutes throw up some of those slides of the parks just so they can see the level of detail that your team's gone into and get a sense for what some of those open space areas might look like? Yeah, uh, just give me one minute. And while you're doing that, uh, a statement from Jonathan. Uh, hope we continue to think of this not as an island and push surrounding communities uh, to align on a greater vision for the entire point of the mountain area. Absolutely. Amen. Um, that's one of our key vision elements. It's one of the key guiding principles that our board has adopted. Uh, we would look at this site as uh, 600 acres in isolation at our peril and peril of the region. So we're very much committed to uh, continuing to collaborate with surrounding communities, counties, transportation agencies, and make sure that collectively we uh, create something that is best for our region and for our state. So I, great comment, Jonathan. Pete, do you have that? Yeah. Okay. Amanda asked the size of the um, school site. Saki, I don't know if you're on the call, but if, if you wanna look that up. Um, so if you can see my screen, this is the, um, uh, the open space plan. Uh, one of the things we tried to do in this drawing was demonstrate the, the variety of, of park types that we will be having. Um, so, there's about 142.5 acres total. Um, 
you can see the relative size of all the parts. Um, a couple of key ideas here. One is, um, of course, the river to range, the central park, which we've talked about, the district parks, which we've shown. Um, a few other elements are the what we're calling the canal parks. So we're actually proposing to expand that canal uh, easement um, into a linear uh, bike trail and, and walking um, uh, asset, both on the north side. So that's part of the plan. Um, and then importantly, we have what we call edge parks, um, which are shown in the most pale green here. And this these serve a variety of purposes. One is um, for connectivity. So it's actually part of the bike and trail system. Secondly, where we need it, we can screen development from external um, elements such as roads or, or other things if, if we choose to do that. Third, it would have a uh, potentially a stormwater management effect. Um, uh, sorry, uh, stormwater management uh, purpose. Um, so there's a variety of both linear and nonlinear um, open space types. Um, these are sort of the programming zones. And this is a little more detail. Let me go to full screen here uh, on the um, detailed design of, of some of the parks. And um, the open space team has gone through and um, created detailed plans for all of the parks. Um, in terms of water conservation, stormwater management, we are we have delineated um, catchment areas. Um, so the site's actually broken into uh, a series of, of catchment basins, uh, sub-districts. Um, so this is how we'll manage that park. But the general idea is to use the open space system as shown in this drawing as part of the green infrastructure strategy. So I think um, certainly unique um, in Utah, hopefully that this project will be um, entirely supported um, through its open space system in terms of how it manages stormwater management. Um, and that will really form a key part of the open space strategy. So it's not just for decoration, it's not just for uh, recreation. Um, and the model for this was, uh, of course, Daybreak, where they saved over $40 million. If we look at River to Range Park, it's actually devoted in, uh, sorry, divided into um, four, um, four uh, reaches or uh, sub lengths. So what we call the Delta at the Northwest, the Reach in the middle, the Central Gateway, which is around the um, Central Park and the, the hub, and then the activated uplands and then that connection over to I-15. The River to Range Park will have, um, it's about um, 300 to 500 feet wide on average, sometimes a little bit narrower than that, sometimes a little bit wider. So it's a substantial dimension. And uh, because of that, we can actually program the edges with more active uh, functions or habitat creation and still use the central part of it for that stormwater management function and some of those linear transportation ideas. So, um, and then the edges where a building meets that edge, those can be active um, with either residential balconies, residential amenities, or um, other types of uh, retail or food service functions. Um, these, this is a very, um, uh, rough um, approximation of, of how that lower part of the river to range, the delta, the bottom could be organized. Um, you can see the um, sports fields, the relative size of those sports fields. You can see the wet um, stormwater zones, what we call wet meadows. Those might have standing water in them at some points of the year, uh, but sometimes um, they might be dry. Um, and then again, the programming of those edge spaces. And um, this is a even more detailed look at, at that particular part of the plan. So we're starting to go in and look at these different um, portions of, of the project and um, do some detailed programming. So I think that the takeaway here is that 
we have a rich um, well to draw from in terms of how we think about open space, how we use it. Um, it won't simply be, as I said, for recreation or decoration, but it actually has a functional um, component and also a, a transportation component. Um, and the Central Park will really be the signature feature. Um, I think that is, let me go back to that. That's, yeah, 6.8 acres as we've talked about. That's a pretty good sized park. Um, uh, and that would have a slightly more formal uh, organization. Um, uh, it's never directly adjacent to the BRT, but it is uh, close. And then um, also the community park or sports park. This is generally how it would be programmed. So it would have a little bit of a parking area, maybe a pavilion, bathrooms, um, baseball, softball, youth soccer, and then fields that are um, flex fields, tennis, pickleball, uh, other types of um, court-based court activities. So you can see generally that that's the, um, just a little sample of um, how the parks are being thought through. And that will also be included in the final framework plan package. But we've done this for um, all of the representative parks in the project. Um, so um, a lot of thinking has gone into how this open space will support that innovation um, mission by uh, providing these amenities that young workers and young um, families that are looking to live in this type of community, they want. Um, Great, thanks, Pete. I appreciate that that overview. And uh, Senator McKay, I saw your question about where the golf course is. Um, <laughs> it's it's behind the drawbridge and where you hit it into the clown's mouth in the center. <laughs> Carefully. Uh, good question. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Uh, Pete, if you uh, can stop sharing, I'll jump on and just give a, a little overview of what comes next. And uh, again, we really appreciate this input. Uh-oh, looks like I've lost it here. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna have to track it down, but let me, let me just finish up with a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, we, uh, as I said, can guarantee you just one thing right now. And that is that things are gonna change a little bit over time. What you've seen here is not what the final product will look like. I think it'll be close to it. I think it gives us great direction as we move ahead, but we also know that we're gonna learn more over time and we're gonna be able to improve it over time. Uh, your input is, is critical uh, in that process. So in terms of some next steps, we are just in the next week uh, going to be issuing solicitations for a number of supplemental studies that need to take place that relate to a number of the questions that you identified. So we've got to do a deeper dive into sustainability. What's, what's uh, available, what's possible, uh, and what do each of those options cost? We're gonna be looking at smart city technologies. How can we incorporate uh, these concepts that create a city of the future? Smart mobility, we'll be looking into circulation more. We'll be uh, diving into the design guidelines that will establish things like how buildings address the street and how we, uh, how we develop. We'll be, uh, thank you, Muriel, pulling that up. You can see that um, we've already started a retail entertainment uh, study, making sure that uh, the numbers that we've got up there are really, um, I guess, uh, realistic in today's market. So again, we're very much trying to push the envelope here. We're trying to create value at the site. We also understand that we are stewards of public resources and have to be responding practically and based on market realities. So we're, we're paying attention to that. Um, beyond that, I guess we can go to the next uh, slide. 
as we gather this information, that's going to help us put together the RFQs and RFPs that we will be sending out to the development community. And uh, we anticipate doing that this fall. We want to make sure that when we reach out to that group, that they have a clear understanding of what we're asking and we're able to enter into a dialogue with them that will be productive. I just identify there uh, under spring 2021, this request for expressions of interest. I think we'd let you know, but I'll just remind you that we reached out to the development community locally and nationally, uh, asking for highly experienced uh, large scale multi uh, use uh, design communities to respond and engage in conversations with us about this plan and about our approach to development going forward. Uh, we ended up talking to over 16 uh, very significant developers and had great in-depth conversations and that greatly informed what uh, this plan looks like and our process going forward. Again, uh, we want to make sure that it's rooted in reality and can actually be done. So taking all that information, taking the information from these additional studies, we will be reaching out and finding the right uh, partners to oversee the development. But I will say there, this is going to be a project that will require uh, many development partners bringing their various skills to the table and helping us accomplish uh, this vision that you've helped create. Muriel, uh, next slide. I think we've shared with you the details on the open house. Would encourage you to reach out to your friends and neighbors and, and uh, give them information about it and encourage them to attend. And so at this point, let me just kind of wrap up with, again, our thanks. We feel very heavy the responsibility to do this right. We feel heavy the stewardship that's been given to us. And this is a project that's driven by the public good. We want to do everything openly and transparently, and we want to do it with the best thinking. And that's where you've come in. Let me just talk about uh, how you might continue and how you will continue to be involved if you're willing. We hope you are. Uh, first of all, as some of these studies come back, we're gonna want your expertise. So as we look at the working groups, um, you know, the air quality and environment working group, would like you to help uh, review and help us uh, develop recommendations based on the sustainability study. Uh, we're working on uh, with the Utah system of higher education to hire a project manager who can come in and help develop the innovation district at the site. And so we'd want our innovation group to be involved in that. We'll be starting to do some recruitment. Uh, interestingly, we've had a lot of uh, interest so far and in multiple corporate headquarters that want to be here. But we'll be reaching out to targeted groups and we'll want our economic development, recruitment, and investment committee to be involved in that. Uh, we'll be looking at transportation options and want our in infrastructure and, and uh, uh, land use planning group to be involved as well. We'd also uh, request your uh, input as we start making future adjustments to this plan. And want to do it not in isolation, but with, uh, again, your review and your input. And then uh, we will probably reach out to individuals among you for help with uh, your relationships, people you know, particular expertise you have, and continue to engage that way. But finally, I'd say we really do want you to be ambassadors for the project, conduits to and from the community. So as you hear from people in your circles that have ideas, that have concerns, we hope you would pass those on to us. As uh, you hear people maybe with misperceptions about what's happening, you can clarify that and share uh, what we're trying to accomplish and how. So um, if you're willing, uh, 
we very much want you to be part of this process going forward and hope that at the end of the day, uh, you can feel great pride in the product that we create. We're creating a place that will be known globally and loved locally. And uh, you're very much part of that. So don't, uh, don't hesitate to, to call if you've got questions or comments. Uh, we want to continue to engage with you. And just finally, thank you, thank you, thank you. You've already made a difference and will continue to. So take care. Enjoy the summer. We'll be in touch before too long.